Hello, everyone. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum to everyone tuning in. We're so excited to have you with us. Uh, my name is Isra Ibrahim, and I am an organizer with the South Florida Coalition for Palestine. Um, first, I want to thank the organizations that are co-sponsoring and co helped to co-develop this webinar series. Uh, we have Al Auda South Florida, which is a Palestinian organization that focuses on the right of return for Palestinians worldwide. We have SJP at Florida International University, an incredibly active, impressive student group in the SOFO movement for Palestine. And we also have Hood Communists, which is a revolutionary African, African nationalist newsletter that I feel like a lot of us read. I know personally I do. Um, that has produced some of the most impressive uh, anti-colonial analyses by and for African people. And we also have the AAPRP, which is the All African People's Revolutionary Party, um, which is a pan-Africanist organization that seeks the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. And last but certainly not least, we have Black Alliance for Peace, uh, a project that advances anti-war and anti-imperialist positions via the radical Black movement. Thank you so much to our incredible organizations that helped to co-sponsor and co-develop this series and everyone who is listening and watching in. So before I start um, our webinar series and introduce our panelists, I first want to provide the, the framework of why we developed this series. We recognize that Palestine, that Palestine, specifically the Islamic resistance in Gaza, is currently the vanguard of this of the world's historical movement. It's the vanguard of anti-colonial struggle today. And with this, we recognize as organizations, as organizers worldwide within the diaspora and out, that there is a need for better understanding, for better theory, for better political analyses to ground and guide our organizing efforts, both locally and globally. We need to be able to continuously understand and heighten our understandings we need to be able to understand and recognize the stage that our movement is at. We need to be able to recognize and deconstruct as well the reactionary ideas and politics that pull our movement down. If theory and analysis is what drives our organizing today, we have to continuously build on our theory and our analysis. So with this in mind, we hope we can push for more organizers to have and maintain principled political frameworks to be able to drive their efforts, both here and abroad. So a couple of logistical notes for our participants. Um, any questions you have during or after this presentation, please utilize the Q&A function. We'll be, we hope to be able to collect your questions at the end for our Q&A portion with our presenters. We are live streaming on the AAPRP uh, YouTube and Facebook platforms. So please share with anyone who is interested and listening and watching in. Today's webinar specifically, we'll, we will be talking about settler colonialism and imperialism. We will be de deconstructing how settler colonialism has emerged as a political structure and how it relates to today's current moment. So just to begin, we will be introducing our panelists. Today we have Nick Estes, Nick is an enrolled member of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, an assistant professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. He is a co-founder of the Indigenous Resistance Organization, the Red Nation, and lead editor, editor of Red Media. In addition, we also have Onion Sioux Chateau, is an, who is an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, an editor with Hood Communist, and a member of the National Coordinating Committee for the Vencermos Brigade, which is the oldest Cuba solidarity de delegation in the U.S. 
Thank you so much to our presenters for being able to be here today, for giving us their time. And with that, I will give the floor to Nick. Thank you so much, uh, Isra, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you uh, for the coalition for inviting me uh, to speak uh, today. I apologize. I had a PowerPoint presentation prepared, but there were some formatting issues. So I'm just going to be reading from the slides. Hopefully you don't get too uh, disinterested and, and turned off. Um, you'll just be hearing my monotone voice the entire time. But I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Red Nation and the work that we do, uh, as well as at Red Media and why that connects with Palestine. So first of all, you know, the Red Nation was founded in 2014 We in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, in uh, Diné and uh, Pueblo territory. Um, we began by addressing what we saw as uh, border town violence. It's like vigilante or state violence against Native people in places um, that we consider border towns. And we it's a very contentious term to say that, but it's a common uh, term within indigenous communities in these regions. And typically we think of borders uh, or border towns as those on this, you know, the so-called U.S.-Mexico border or perhaps the northern uh, Canadian-U.S. border. Um, but we think of border towns as those, uh, you know, white dominated settlements that typically ring Indian reservations um, where these sort of confrontations of sovereignty, of political legitimacy and authority kind of come to a head. And it's it comes to a head through the everyday criminalization of Native people and their presence on the land. Uh, and that's an incredibly important, you know, a topic uh, to an entry point into discussing uh, the topic today, which is settler colonialism. Um, but of course, as a Red Nation, we weren't just focused uh, specifically on uh, police uh, or state violence against Native people within these uh, these geographies of border town violence. Um, but we looked at the sort of broader sort of imperialist uh, scale of this violence and the project of the United States from the beginning uh, of its foundation in 1776 and perhaps even before that uh, to the present day. Um, and why the United States, um, is sort of has aligned itself with, you know, historically with the sort of imperialist European powers, but now has become the global hegemon. Uh, and that actually begins here on this land. It doesn't begin, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world. Typically we think of, uh, imperialism or settler colonialism according to really outmoded theories of, you know, the, what they call the blue water thesis or the salt water thesis, meaning that it can only be imperialism if somebody, typically a white European, you know, travels across a body of water and colonizes a place, right? And we know that that uh, just simply isn't the case. Uh, first of all, ge geographically and territorially, that doesn't make sense, you know, because uh, Europe is is a is a complete social construct. It's literally just Western Asia <laughs> when you think about it. So how did it colonize parts of Asia? Uh, and then it's also, you know, st also still somewhat connected to uh, the continent of Africa. So these things are just arbitrary and they're social constructs uh, made to sort of uh, give us an idea of, of what is and what isn't imperialist and what is and what isn't a settler colonial. So oftentimes if the United States is talked about as, as possessing you know, colonial territories. It's typically we think of Puerto Rico or Hawaii or Guam uh, or something along those lines, typically island nations, right? Or there's a body of water separating them. Um, but we don't think of settler colonialism or we don't think of colonialism or imperialism as something that is continentally connected, right? Um, which which I'll, I'll get, I'll break it down a little bit later. Um, but I just want to kind of throw that out there right away to, to think about why is it, how did the United States become, you know, not only the global hegemon, but the main benefactor of the Israeli Zionist settler colonial project in Palestine? How did that happen? There are several sort of explanations for this. You know, one is the sort of ideology, right? Um, of manifest destiny, which I can talk about uh, in a bit, uh, and the concept of Zionism, 
right? It's important to point out that Christian Zionism actually preceded what we now know as the modern sort of Zionist movement. And in fact, there are more Christian Zionists in the United States than there are, you know, uh, Jewish Zionists proper. That's a, that's an important facet. Uh, to point out because it's typically non-Jewish people. There are more non-Jewish people in the United States that support the Zionist project than there are Jewish people. And this is, this, it has to do with ideology. It has to do with geopolitics. Um, and, and in the case of Christian Zionists, it's grounded in a sort of religious uh, kind of a fundamental understanding of what the Holy Land is, but it, as we'll see, in a bit, it ties into uh, broader geopolitics. But before I continue, I just want to um, give out some resources because um, you might fall asleep by the end of this this talk. Hopefully you don't. But I just want to give out some resources um, that I recommend everyone uh, 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 read. There's a great pol- uh, website called decolonizedpalestine.com. It's, it's a very uh, useful toolbox. It's a 101 explanation of all the myths that Israel uh, and its backers put out there in terms of, you know, it's a anti-colonial movement. It's a, you know, uh, uh, Zionists are actually indigenous. Oh, I got some confetti. I don't know how that happened through scare quotes. Um, uh, or that it's a conflict or it's a conflict between nationalisms, like an Arab nationalism and a sort of Jewish nationalism. Uh, and they do, they go through great pains at deconstructing, uh, and debunking these notions. The other, um, the other, uh, uh, resource that I would recommend is it's called indigenous uh, for Palestine.org. This was uh, formed in collaboration with the Red Nation, as well as other indigenous organizations, um, initially started as a letter writing campaign um, to get tribal leaders uh, and uh, our our leadership to to acknowledge and to condemn uh, Zionist aggression against Palestinians uh, and sort of understanding our sort of our situations uh, under settler colonialism as connected. Um, but we we over the time we've developed some blog posts uh, sort of connecting the current moment to a broader history of indigenous resistance, as well as some resources that are specifically about indigenous and Palestinian history. Um, So I recommend uh, checking those out. We have some wonderful um, YouTube uh, interviews um, that you can access. We have the Red Nation podcast, too, if you're not already a subscriber. Um, Those are just some, you know, shameless uh, self-promotion. So just let's get into some definitional um, uh, definitional sort of terms, right? So I, I said I said several things like imperialism, settler colonialism. Um, those are some you know ten dollar words, as my dad likes to say, um, but they're very important to understand. First of all, we didn't invent them. There's this kind of notion out there that like native people or you know left or woke the woke mob. Uh, or the the uh, the people that Zionists like to label as anti-Semitic, which are just people who are critical of the Zionist project, they like to say that we invented settler colonialism, which isn't true. It's actually uh, settler colonialists invented that term <laughs> settler colonialism, and they called themselves settlers and colonialists and colonizers. It's just when it became out of vogue that they began to change the name and the nature or tried to redefine the nature of their project. We can see that in in the concept in the in the context of uh, of of Israel, for example, the original founders, uh, such as like Theodore Herzl or like uh, Zionist thinkers such as Jabotinsky, um, actually called this a, a a colonial project and referred to themselves as the future settlers of of this of Palestine. And even they, you know, people are like, "Oh, Palestine is an invented term," but they even use the term. You know, Palestine. And I just want to read uh, one uh, quote um, to kind of give you an idea of how uh, these, uh, you know, these these early Zionist thinkers were thinking about um, Palestinians, indigeneity and settler colonialism. And this is a quote from uh, a 19, 1923 uh, article called The Iron Wall by um, Zayev, uh, uh, Jabotinsky, who was uh, a Russian uh, uh, Zionist. Um, but he he writes, you know, every native population, civilized or not, notice the language, regards its lands as its national home, of which it is the sole master. 
and it wants to retain that mastery always. It will refuse to emit not only new masters, i.e. Zionists, even new partners or collaborators. This is equally true of the Arabs, i.e. the Palestinians. Our peacemongers are trying to persuade us that the Arabs are either fools whom can be who can deceive by masking our real aims or they they are corrupt and can be bribed to abandon us uh, their claim to priority in Palestine notice the word Palestine in return for cultural and economic advantages i repudiate this conception of the palestinian arabs culturally they are 500 years behind us they have neither endurance nor our determination. But they are just as good psychologists as we are, and their minds have been sharpened, like ours, by centuries of fine spine spun logomachy. I don't even know what that term means. We may tell them whatever we like about the, the innocence of our aims. Watering them down and sweetening them with honeyed words to make them palatable. But they know what we want as well as we know what they do not want, right? Let me repeat that. They know what we want, the Zionists, as well as we know what they, the Palestinians, do not want. They feel at least the same instinctive jealous love of Palestine as the old Aztecs felt for ancient Mexico and their Sioux for their rolling hills i.e. the Lakota, my people. So here, as we can see, Jabotinsky is, is positioning himself as the colonizer. He's positioning himself as the United States positioned itself against us, Lakota people, here. And I bring this up because it's it's directly justifying, on one hand, the United States' colonization and taking of native lands, but it's also situating a Zionist as a European kind of formation into the role of colonizer and understanding that the, you know, the, the, Air, the what they call the Arab Palestinians are not going to be easily fooled by this sort of idea of treaty making like they did with us, that they know that we are coming to take their land, that they know that we are coming to remove them and to replace them. So this is an important sort of, you know, uh, letter just to kind of lay it out there. They're identifying explicitly a settler colonial project that it's going to require not only the subjugation of Palestinians, but their removal and their concession to, um, you know, by force, hence the name Iron Wall. That's the name of the essay uh, by force to the will of European colonizers. Right. So that's that's settler colonialism in a nutshell. That is a far different project than what we we typically uh, understand and know as something called franchise colonialism. Or perhaps, you know, there's another version of colonialism called internal colonialism. And, and it's important to, to distinguish them from this version of colonialism, which is settler colonialism. Because on one hand, internal colonialism, if we look at um, you know, um, uh, like in in the Americas or in the Western Hemisphere, it's typically indigenous groups uh, uh, are, or nations are within um, those nation states. They're dominated, but they're not necessarily eliminated or removed. They, there are removal processes, right? There's racialization processes that take place, but it's not a kind of settler uh, you know, colonial kind of project, the way that we're seeing with the United States uh, and and Israel. Um, and that's, you know, there's a lot of debate about that term, uh, internal colonialism, but we can bracket that off to like a Q&A. And then the, the, the second uh, version is uh, franchise colonialism, which is like the traditional colonialism, right? It's the colonialism of of the British and in, in places like India, for example, where, yes, the the British ruled India and did awful things to, you know, the subcontinent. There are many different, you know, it's not just Indians. There are thousands of different ethnic groups, indigenous groups within what is now the kind of state of, of India or the nation state of India. But this 
project that the uh, British uh, implemented within uh, India was a an extractive project, right? About extracting materials, extracting, you know, the, the labor of, of the people, but it was never intended on replacing the indigenous population with Br- British colonial, uh, and settler subjects. But it's not to say that like, you know, settler colonialism and franchise colonialism are different in violence. They're both incredibly violent, right? We can think about the mass starvation of people in India, you know, at the turn of the 19th century, like tens of millions of people were starved to death, right? Um, as a result of this kind of, of this kind of colonialism, or we can look at, you know, the Cote d'Ivoire or the Congo and think about the kind of franchise colonialism that was about extracting, literally extracting human bodies from Africa uh, and the immense amount of, uh, you know, of, of violence, death and destruction, but it never, it, it never created a sort of settler population to replace, uh, you know, the indigenous African people. So those are important things to distinguish, not to say, you know, like one is more inherently more violent than the other, or like one is, you know, has some sort of unique uh, pro, you know, there is a unique process, internal process, but it's part of the same sort of overarching structure of, you know, a, a spe- specifically European imperialism. Um, and I'll talk about that, you know, in, in, a, in a little bit, but just to kind of, just to kind of uh, go over some more examples, you know, tip, you know, there's a post-colonial India, right? There, there are very few instances in which there's a post-colonial or post-settler colonialism. I think uh, probably the the one example that comes to mind, and I disagree with some of, um, and my mind has been changed on on a lot of these things over time. Um, there's really great uh, theorists and thinkers and historians such as Joseph Joseph Massad, um, who've who've really challenged my conception of uh, of what settler colonialism is and how it occurs. Uh, but there's also you know Robin D G Kelly has a response to uh, the the. Australian uh, scholar Patrick Wolf, when he talks about just like kind of like the Anglo settler colonies of New Zealand, Australia, um, United States, Canada, et cetera, as being the only settler colonies. Um, but we now know, I think, with a more a robust analysis of history, that South Africa was a settler colony, that Algeria was a settler colony of, of France. And we saw in the Algerian situation, the process of decolonization, right? It was an attempt to subjugate and eliminate the native population, if not uh, through outright annihilation, but through political and, you know, uh, state sanctioned violence to subjugate them, you know, that decolonization process was incredibly violent. It was, you know, millions, if not 10 million people, um, died as a result of that very violent kind of struggle. And we see the same, a similar kind of process unfolding in, uh, you know, in, in South Africa where we, 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 where the term, uh, apartheid was invented, right? And it's important to talk about what apartheid is because there's a UN uh, definition of the crime of apartheid um, that was developed uh, in in the 1960s, I believe, um, by the anti-apartheid struggle. It's been applied not only to the South African situation, but it's also been applied to the Palestinian situation. But it's not entirely an accurate framing because it's a technology of settler colonialism. It's a technology of rule. It's a way of carving up a territory to concentrate people on land or Bantu stands in the, in the case of South Africa um, through a racial segregation process. Um, we call that in the United States reservations or in Canada, the reserve system, right? And these British, you know, there, there was both kind of influenced by British colonial rule, they were talking to each other. They were saying, you know, Bantu stands are like the, the native reservations of the South, right? But while, you know, the, the apartheid system was, you know, in place, there was a distinct knowledge that the people who were placed in within these Bantu stands were actually indigenous people speaking indigenous language, speaking uh, Swahili, speaking, uh, you know, Zulu, speaking all kinds of different indigenous languages, and some, you know, some people, you know, in very rare instances got so comfortable as, you know, we see oftentimes in reservation systems with the kind of the, the territorial sort of rule of a, you know, of a, 
of a government, um, some sort of self-autonomy, um, that they kind of naturalize those conditions, right? And the anti-apartheid movement was about denaturalizing that condition and saying that the white minority controls 70% of the land, 70%, therefore 70% of the resources, while the black majority sits in destitute and is dispossessed from the land, right? And that's the other facet of settler colonialism is that settler colonialism is fundamentally about land and territory. And while, you know, this is kind of a signposting um, something I want to talk about at the end of this conversation, we talk about decolonization and what justice looks like in the context of settler colonialism. We often think, you know, there's a very nice framing that, you know, we have the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, um, you know, applying pressure on apartheid South Africa to, you know, end its apartheid colonial structure. Um, but there was also an active armed resistance movement opposed to the, you know, the apart and it, you know, spilled into Rhodesia. It was, it wasn't just something that was confined to South Africa, but it was a regional war. It was about decolonization and entailed more than just one country. You know, Cuba sent, um, you know, they sent uh, soldiers there. And, and in fact, if Cuba at the, you know, at the request of the anti-apartheid struggle and the liberation movement, if they hadn't been there, they probably, you know, they probably wouldn't have been as victorious uh, in that in that particular struggle. Um, there's a great, you know, if you ever want to hear it's it's something that hasn't been written about a lot. Uh, Cuba's sort of solidarity, like military solidarity, it's acknowledged. But there's a book, um, uh, it's called, I think it's called Fidel Castro Speaks. And Fidel, you know, talks a lot about that sort of, you know, that history. And, uh, you know, there were, you know, the Cubans were actively engaged in, engaged in an armed struggle against, you know, Rhodesian soldiers. Um, but Israel was also a kind of a party to this, this uh, struggle and keeping apartheid in place. Israel gave uh, South Africa the, you know, the nuclear, the nuclear bomb. Right. And made it a nuclear power. And this idea that once we install a nuclear arsenal into South Africa, it will make the racial white supremacist apartheid regime permanent. It will make settler colonialism permanent. Right. Um, and if we think about even uh, somebody like Nelson Mandela, a lot of people don't know why Nelson Mandela was in prison for such a long time. It was because he refused to renounce armed resistance as a legitimate form of struggle and self-defense, period. That's why he was in prison. And a lot of people kind of, you know, whitewash, you know, <laughs> that's not a metaphor, whitewash that history. Um, and that he was also a steadfast supporter of Palestinian resistance. Uh, and that's important to remember. It was because of the so-called civil society pressures, the nonviolent boycotts and protests, union organization and mobilization combined with a popular struggle against the apartheid regime. That's what brought it down, right? It wasn't just hugging the murder out of colonizers, um, as often we are implored to do while they shoot us dead, right? In our, in our homes, uh, in our streets and in our own homelands, right? So I think that's an important aspect, uh, to remember. Um, Bell, I just want to uh, do a time check. How much time do I have left? Twenty-one minutes. How many minutes? Twenty-one. Okay. So the next section, I'm, the next section I want to move into is talking about imperialism um, and uh, and Zionism and manifest destiny, right? The United States was literally a, a small when it when it declared its so-called independence from Britain. It was a small it was small thirteen colonies hugging right the eastern seaboard, which over the course of a century rapidly expanded to uh, an annex billions of acres of land and territory. Right, that oftentimes that violence of expansion was tied into the expansion of chattel slavery, the, the, the enslavement of African peoples, as well as the genocide of indigenous peoples, right? Um, and this is an important turning point in, in not just, uh, you know, the history of North America, but global capitalism as we know it. We have an army of, you know, free laborers who are laboring for free on the land, 
uh, and we're and we have quote quote unquote free land taken from uh, people who are being eliminated and destroyed, right? But typically, when we talk about settler colonialism, we don't think of that as imperialism. But the annexation of territory and land is a form of imperialism. If you look at a map of the United States, you will see every single state was carved out of indigenous territory in a negotiated settlement about whether or not it was going to be a so-called free state or a slave state, right? So westward expansion, even in the political context of formations of states, was fundamentally about expanding on one hand uh, the institution of chattel slavery as well as the in, the genocide of indigenous, the genocide and removal of indigenous peoples. Uh, and this often happened through treaties. These treaties weren't just like you know, it wasn't this like a mutual coming together of people. There was one side that had a clear intent to take the land. Right. Um, and it was it happened basically through trick or treaty in the sense that if you do not sign this treaty, we will wage endless war upon you. Right. And this was guaranteed in the very founding document of the United States, which is the Declaration of Independence. Read it, please, because the third, the 23rd, um, the 23rd complaint that the the American colonists have filed against the King of England said that, you know, the merciless Indian savages who inhabit our frontier, you know, whose only known rule of warfare is the destruction of any age of person, any sex, man, woman, or child, right? In other words, they're, they're waging a savage war on us. That was pure projection. Um, it was a way to dehumanize native people in the first instance to make their resistance appear as something that that goes beyond what we understand the normal rules of warfare, therefore subjecting not just uh, native soldiers, uh, native warriors um, for elimination and target, but also subjugating women, children, people who are considered, quote unquote, non-combatants or civilians, right? That the the entire destruction of indigenous peoples was guaranteed as a form of self-defense. The first rule of settler colonialism is to make invasion look like self-defense. Watch any Western movie, watch any U.S. military movie that came out during the war on terror before, and they make the cowboy, the American soldier, an invader to a land who is surrounded by native people, and he has to kill all these native people in order to defend his territory, right? Which he invaded and stole. That's the, the, you know, that is the, you know, the United States is just one bad Western movie, right? When you really think about it. And, 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 and in that, you know, in that case, I guess like the state of Israel is just an even worse Western movie. <laughs> like um, when you think about it, but I think that's an important sort of cultural phenomenon to point out and how, manifest destiny sort of you know ingrains itself within the everyday culture of of settlers themselves because it's not just a political ideology it's some it's a cultural ideology it is the status quo of a society right so when we say things like land back when we advocate for you know the the return of land that was rightly rightfully taken from us and you hear you know african revolutionaries say this all the time we will pay you for the land, what your ancestors paid us for the land, because that is justice. And then you hear, you know, all these, you know, white people freaking out in Africa being like white genocide, right? Because they know that they took the land. They didn't pay anything for the land, right? Um, and they had to, in fact, they had to enslave and genocide people just as they did uh, to people here uh, in the United States. So when they think of justice, when we advocate uh, for our fundamental right to exist and to have access to our territory, uh, which is actually upheld by the laws of the colonizer to begin with, that it becomes, oh, they're going to do to us what we did to them. Because the settler colonial mentality is a zero sum game. There can be no alternative other than the settler state. Period. That's that's the reality. So whenever native people in the United States advocate for land back, we don't constitute a majority of the demo, you know, the, the population of the United States. You know, we don't pres uh, present a military threat to the United States. But nonetheless, when we engage in nonviolent resistance, even to that extent, to protect our water, 
from the expansion of oil pipelines across our lands, we are criminalized. We are called terrorists. Much in the same vein and spirit of the founding fathers who, who you know, called us merciless Indian savages, right? Um, and that's an important fact to remember, right? It's an important fact to also understand that with the the kind of uh, barbarity and the brutality in which the United States destroys or attempts to destroy indigenous nations and sub subjugate us to take our land, to criminalize us. This isn't something that happened in the 19th century. It happened during the 1970s, the formation of the American Indian movement and the Red Power movement. The FBI deployed, you know, its goons to essentially destroy that movement, to destroy it from the inside to the point that we, you know, we have in, in southern Southern Florida, not in Southern Florida, but in Florida, the known political prisoner of Leonard Peltier. He's the longest serving indigenous political prisoner in the United States. Why? Because his co-defendants in a case um, were let off, declared not guilty by reason of self-defense for for shooting to shooting and killing two FBI agents who came onto land, opened fire, gunfight ensued, uh, and these his co-defendants were acting in self-defense, but Leonard Peltier was tried separately um, and found guilty for a crime he claims he never committed, right? But it wasn't just about adjudicating that sort of criminal act. It was about punishing the Red Power movement, the indigenous movement for liberation and to to capture it, right? To, to uh, basically subjugate it and to destroy it, right? So when we think about imperialism, it's not just the expansion of, you know, this kind of economic system to take resources. It's also about destroying any alternative that arises to challenge its, its hegemony. Why, why invade Vietnam, you know, uh, which was largely a peasant country at that particular in time because of the spread of communism, right? Because of the spread of an alternative to capitalism. That's why, that's what we're also seeing in the context of Palestine, when, you know, when after the, the Nakba in 1948, um, you know, the United, the, the state of Israel wasn't really, it was on the radar of the United States, but it wasn't really on the radar of the United States. It was, you know, the United States was kind of lukewarm when it came to Israel. Sure, it supported the project, you know, this and that, but it wasn't until 1967 that when the when the when Israel you know the 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 war in 1967 that Israel proved itself in the eyes of the United States as a legitimate military presence uh, in the Middle East to destroy to break apart and to finish um you know finish dividing up and and subjugating these you know newly kind of arising arab uh, muslim nations within uh, the Middle East uh, to bend towards the will of the United States. You know, Joe Biden has has said, you know, before he became president, that if Israel didn't exist, we would invent it. He didn't mean it in the terms of like an apology for a European apology for what Europeans did to uh, to uh, Jewish people and their, their long, violent, genocidal history against Jewish people in Europe. No, he meant it as a military base, that, you, that Israel would be the projection of power of the United States within the region. It would destabilize. It would it would it would break the sort of solidarity between uh, these these Arab nations who had resources. Um, that the United States, you know, wanted to maintain access to, right? So it had to destroy political alternatives that were arising within it. The the non-aligned movement, the decolonization movement, the Arab national movements, right? That were coming through. So this is uh, this is a, the reason why when we talk about settler colonialism, it's not just you know it's not just a kind of land based you know uh, project within a, a territory of Palestine, which is not very much larger than the state of New Jersey, right? This is a small territory, but yet it has captured the imagination of both the imperialist and those struggling to get free. Such a tiny, tiny place has such a major you know, impact on world politics and geopolitics and the shifts that are happening and the struggles to get free. Such a tiny nation has such a big heart for the rest of the world, right? That we as indigenous people here, you know, it's bleeding. We can see it. 
but it's beating strong and it's it's beating strong not just because of our solidarity and our good wishes and us taking to the streets but because there's active resistance right it's the only way that they're going to survive this genocidal onslaught and they don't want us to think of them if they do think of the want us to think of them they don't want us to think of them but anything beyond just being a victim right but they are agents just like we were agents in our time period we were agents and makers of our own history and that's what they're trying to they're to, they're trying to recapture they're trying to put them back into bondage and say no you will not be your agent of own history you can only be a terrorist or you can only be dead right those are the only two options that they provide uh not only for people who decide that they don't you know they don't want to buy what the, the united states is selling um, but they also say that to the people who whose very existence is dependent on them, you know, standing up to the colonizer. And so um, this I'm, I'm out of time, but I think this is the kind of crux of the issue in this particular uh, moment. And the reason, you know, when we think about settler colonialism, there's often this other kind of framing to think about, well, it's the breakaway from a mother country. But I would say that Israel, like the United States, has never fully broken away from its European parents. It is funda- Both are fundamentally European projects. And we can't look, you know, we can't look to the imperialist kind of alternatives that have been provided to us, which are destroying the planet. They're holding the world hostage. We can't have any other economic, social alternative. Um, so they, that cannot be the path that we take. Europe must pay for Europe's, Europe's crimes, but it is not a, incumbent on, upon us to adopt those as our, our sort of principles and our understanding of what it means to not only be human, but what it means to be free and to advocate for freedom. And so when we think about this in this context, the, the Israel could, can only exist through its primary benefactor, its mother country, the United States and Europe, right? Much as when the United States declared its so-called independence and led its counter-revolutionary war against us uh, and our black relatives, it benefited Europe. It raised the standing, the standard of living in Europe. Those trade goods went there, much in the same way that the continued projection of U.S. power in that region benefits the ruling class here. in in the United States uh, and in Europe. So I'll just end it there. And thanks so much for listening. All right. Thank you so much to Nick for that incredibly comprehensive. That was not, I was not bored. I was riveted even without the slides. So deeply appreciate you comrade um, for sharing so much knowledge with us and really grounding us in exactly what settler colonialism is and exactly what Zionism is. So um, Isra gave me an intro at the top of the webinar, but you might have forgotten. So just to refresh your memory, my name is Onyesan Mushatoye. I am an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. The APRP is one of the organizers of this event. We are a revolutionary pan-African socialist political party. We have been an anti-Zionist movement, our organization, since our inception. And we are part of the worldwide anti-Zionist movement, as well as the worldwide pan-African movement. And what I'd like to talk about today, and I do have some slides. I love a slideshow. <laughs> so I'm going to put them up on the screen. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today is to reiterate what Nick just broke down to us so clearly and to contextualize the Zionist project, the settler colonial project of Israel, the settler colonial project of the U.S. empire within the larger global context of settler colonialism by doing some comparing and contrasting. And then I'm going to wrap it up by talking about the necessity of resistance to imperialism and settler colonialism and why we must politically, materially support it. So I want to start with a quote um, from a book that is quite controversial in uh, settler states for reasons that are obvious when you read it. The book is called Settlers. It was written by a man named Jay Sakai. And the whole book is available for free online. And I'll drop the link in the chat. I'm like doing double presenter tech duty. So I can't drop the link now, but I will drop it um, before the end of the webinar. So he says... Capitalism needed giant armies of settlers, waves and waves of new European shock troops 
to help conquer and hold new territory, to develop it for the bourgeoisie, and to garrison it against the oppressed. And what the book Settlers is talking about is the specific settler colonial history of the United States. It makes a strong argument that settler colonialism in the U.S. context was a cross-class project, meaning that the European ruling class and the European working class allied formed a temporary alliance to dispossess and commit genocide against indigenous peoples, to enslave African peoples, and to seed the, uh, uh, place the seeds that grew into the U.S. empire. And so what he's saying in this quote is that settler colonialism is essentially a tactic of capitalism. Capitalism uses settler colonialism to acquire new territories, acquire new markets, engage in primitive accumulation, and settlers, whether they be working class, petty B, ruling class, etc., are engaged collectively in that project. So Zionism, point blank period, is settler colonialism. A lot of time and energy is invested by the ruling class, by the Zionist movement, by global imperialism to confuse folks about this basic fact. But like Nick laid out, Zionism, just like U.S. nationalism, was white supremacist and imperialist from its inception. It is not an ancient religious struggle. It is not an indigenous liberation movement. It is not any kind of liberation movement. It has, from its very inception, been white supremacist, a tactic of Western imperialism, and aligned with Western imperialism globally. And Israel is very, very clear about this. This is part of the reason why the U.S. provides undying support to Israel, and it's part of the reason why Israel conceptualizes itself as a bastion of so-called Western democracy in the Middle East. From the very beginning, Zionism was, was about stealing land, was about stealing resources, and was about extending the influence of Western imperialism to new territories at the expense of the indigenous population, the Palestinians. It has always been right-wing, even if sometimes people are like, I'm a liberal Zionist. I support Palestinian liberation. I'm not giving the land back, though. It's still the same thing. It's still white supremacist. It's still imperialist. It's still settler colonialism. And to understand this clearly, it's useful to compare and contrast the Israeli project of Zionism to other settler colonial projects that have happened across the world throughout history. So I want to start by talking about Zimbabwe. Much of the African continent, particularly Southern Africa, experienced the strategy of settler colonialism. European settlers coming to the shores of Africa, engaging in projects of genocide against Africans and trying to set up uh, basically European republics, European democracies on stolen African land. Um, Zimbabwe was formerly known as Rhodesia when it was occupied by British imperialism. The African people in Zimbabwe endured several hundred years of colonization by the British until they rose up in a national liberation struggle that was victorious in 1979. The African people of Zimbabwe then went on to engage in a program known as the Land Reform Program, which is essentially them taking their land back. And in response, British imperialism, U.S. imperialism, as well as the United Nations, which was dominated by imperialist countries, responded by sanctioning Zimbabwe. So if you've heard about any of this history at all, you probably knew about Rhodesia. You probably knew about British settler colonialism in Zimbabwe. And you probably heard about the land reform program and heard it was a failure, that it destroyed Zimbabwe's economy because somehow African people had forgotten how to take care of our own land. But that is not actually what happened. The land reform program was successful and the land reform program has to be replicated across settler colonies all over this world. We have to take the land back, indigenous peoples, whether they are Africans or Palestinians or indigenous nations in the Western Hemisphere, are the best stewards of their own land. So don't believe the hype. It wasn't land reform that destroyed Zimbabwe's economy. It was economic sanctions applied by the entities that stole their land in the first place as revenge for taking their land back. In terms of how that land was stolen in Zimbabwe, we see similar strategies across contexts. The people carrying out might differ. The technology of how the strategy is carried out might differ, but the strategies are pretty similar. They engage in acts of irregular warfare, meaning warfare that specifically targeted civilians and civilian infrastructure. I'm talking about women and children, elders, disabled people. I'm talking about going for the water supply. I'm talking about salting the earth so that 
keep Africans in Zimbabwe could not grow food. And if this reminds you of tactics that Israel is currently carrying out in occupied Palestine, like restricting access to food and water, like destroying the land that Palestinians need to sustain themselves, that is because it is the same process. It is settler colonialism carried out by different forces with shared strategies. Other examples of how the process of settler colonialism unfolded in Zimbabwe include what I refer to as legal trickery, meaning that the British would sign treaties with the Africans in Zimbabwe and say, okay, you get this little bit of land and we get this. And then they would go back on those treaties. And that is what settler colonizers be doing. They did it in the Western Hemisphere. They did it in Palestine. They do it all over the world. They use their own legal framework to buy themselves time to pretend that they are interested um, in coexisting. And then they completely abandon whatever agreement they make as soon as it is in their interest to do so, because the ultimate objective is always to completely dispossess the indigenous people, to destroy their culture, to steal their land, to commit genocide against them, and to forcibly assimilate the minority that remain. The other thing that we see in Zimbabwe when it was known as Rhodesia, actually, I hear someone off mute, and I'm just going to go ahead and fix that. Thank you. Um, the other thing about Zimbabwe when it was known as Rhodesia, when it was under British imperialist control, is we saw um, Rhodesia uh, engaging in re reactionary internationalism with other settler states. They had close relationships with the U.S. government. They had close relationships with apartheid South Africa. They engaged in strategies of solidarity where they were like spying on each other's resistance movements, where they were engaging in weapons deals, where they were sharing tactics of repression. Throughout history, across settler colonial states, you see these states, whether it's Rhodesia, whether it's the U.S., whether it's Israel, sharing strategies across borders for how to best repress their indigenous populations, for how to best engage in land theft and resource extraction. And this is going to come up again. So um, and the other thing about Rhodesia is that as anti-colonial movements were popping off across the African continent, the settler government in Rhodesia was extremely interested in engaging in strategies of counter-revolution. They were a force of reaction against African liberation movements carried out by Africans. And again, they did that in solidarity with the U.S., with the part outside Africa, and with other reactionary settler states. And the picture on the slide is just, I feel like it's a really good illustration of what I'm talking about, about settler colonialism being a cross-class project, about the settler working class and the ruling class coming together with a temporary alliance to dispossess indigenous people. Like, this is a, a, a mom and her child, and it would be like a very, like, it would be like someone's, like, family photo, if not for the fact that she was holding a gun, because she was a settler in Rhodesia. Um, next example, and Nick already went into this deeply, so I'm just going to briefly touch on it. Um, it's really important to understand that when we talk about Zionism being a settler colonial project that must be opposed, we have to understand that the U.S. is also a settler colonial project that must be opposed. The only way that the U.S. empire came into being was with the mass disposition and attempted genocide against indigenous people, the enslavement of African people, and imperialism that began in U.S. territory and expanded throughout the Western Hemisphere and the world. From its inception, the United States of America has been an imperialist and white supremacist project from the beginning. And so if we're saying that we must oppose Zionism, if we're saying that we must stand for Palestinian national liberation because we oppose settler colonialism, then we have to reckon with what it means to live in the belly of the beast, to live in the most powerful settler state on the planet that is propping up all of the other ones. You cannot oppose Zionism without also opposing U.S. imperialism and the U.S. settler state. Indigenous people are still here. The United States and the entire Western Hemisphere is still their land, period. And the tactics that the, the settler colonizers in the U.S. and throughout the Western Hemisphere used to steal indigenous land, again, mirrors how it unfolded in Zimbabwe, how it unfolded in Palestine, how it unfolded in Algeria and in settler states, settler colonies all over the world. Again, 
those tactics of irregular warfare, specifically targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure. I'm talking about water supplies. I'm talking about food supplies. I'm talking about salting the earth so nothing can grow. I'm talking about signing treaties and then completely ignoring them. I'm talking about engaging in practices of forced assimilation, like residential schools. These are shared tactics of settler colonialism globally, and the U.S. was no exception. And then another example, um, which is little discussed uh, because this population has been forcibly assimilated into U.S. American identity, but the one of the earliest targets of British imperialism was, in fact, Irish people. Irish land was stolen and is still currently stolen by Britain. It was one of the first nations ever to be colonized by the British Empire. And these are European people. These are people who are racialized as white, um, who are still who are still subjected to this process of land theft, of resource theft, of racialization, of dehumanization. They saw the same strategies of regular warfare, of again targeting food supplies, water supplies. They saw long-term military occupation that is ongoing on their own land. They see their population being racialized and criminalized by their occupiers. And the example of Ireland, whose national liberation struggle is still ongoing and what should be part of the conversation about global resistance to settler colonialism, really shows you how imperialism can racialize and dehumanize anyone. The point is to steal the land. The point is to steal the resources. If they want your land, it doesn't actually matter what you look like. They will racialize you too and take it. So I want to um, bring it back to Israel. We talked about what settler colonialism looks like and the shared tactics across contexts, whether it's Zimbabwe, whether it's Turtle Island, whether it's Ireland. So let's bring it back to occupied Palestine and make it really, really clear what it is we're dealing with. So um, Theodore Herzl, um, as Nick mentioned, is one of the ideological forefathers of the Zionist movement. He wrote this book, The Jewish State, which is actually not that long a read and which I highly recommend to understand the political foundations of Zionism and the imperialist foundations of Zionism. So this is Theodore Herzl in a letter to Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes was one of the main architects of settler colonialism in South Africa. So this is what Theodore Herzl was saying to uh, Cecil Rhodes. He says, you are the only man who can help me now. It is a big, some say, too big thing. To me, it does not seem too big for Cecil Rhodes. You're being invited to help make history. That cannot frighten you, nor will you laugh at it. It is not in your accustomed line. It doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, not Englishmen, but Jews. But had this been on your path, you would have done it by now. How, then? Do I happen to turn to you since this is an out of the way matter for you? How indeed? Because it is something colonial. And the concept context of this excerpt, the what is Theodore Herzl doing in this letter? He's basically writing to Cecil Rhodes and being like, I see what you've done in South Africa. I'd like to do it in Palestine. What are some of the strategies you use? What is the best way for us to do it here? This is Theodore Herzl clearly conceptualizing the expansion of Zionism into Palestinian territory as an explicitly colonial movement, expanding Western influence into Asia the same way that Cecil Rhodes and his cohorts did into Africa. And so again, the media, the ruling class, the Zionist movement works very, very, very hard to confuse people about what Zionism is, to conflate Judaism and the Zionist movement. But it is very, very clear, even to the founders of Zionism, that Zionism has always been about imperialism, specifically Western imperialism. It has always been about settler colonialism. It has always been about white supremacy. It is an insult to Judaism and Jewish people to conflate Zionism and that religion. Zionists don't even do it except to be extremely cynical and cover themselves from criticism. All right. So continuing the conversation about um, Zionism in Palestine and around the world, like I said, settler states um, have each other's back. There is reactionary inter -solidar international solidarity between settler states all over the world. Israel itself is an outpost of U.S.-led Western imperialism 
in the Middle East. And there is a reason why the U.S. has always had Israel's back. We have been in the streets by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, all over this, all the world from Ghana to Orlando to London, all over this planet. Thousands of people are in the streets saying ceasefire now, saying Israel must stop. And the U.S. ruling class, the Western ruling class, it says, hell no. As a matter of fact, the Biden administration has two times now bypassed congressional approval in order to send billions of dollars in weapons to Israel to continue Israel's uh, genocide of Palestinians. The Biden administration has outright refused to seriously consider a ceasefire, and they have instead engaged in demonization of Palestinian solidarity organizing. And the reason for this is because the U.S. very, very clearly understands that Israel is key to Western imperialist strategy in the Middle East, just as Rhodesia and apartheid South Africa were key to Western imperialist strategy in Africa. That is the reason why when the whole world was boycotting apartheid South Africa, the Reagan administration was sending them weapons. This is the reason why when the whole world was standing in solidarity with Ireland's national liberation struggle, the U.S. was working overtime to demonize the Irish resistance as terrorists. There has always been solidarity with Western settler colonial states all over this planet, and that is because they have shared interests of violence and domination. Another really clear example of the reactionary solidarity between the U.S. and Israel as Western imperialist outposts as settler states is what's known as the deadly exchange. And that is the practice of U.S. police forces traveling to Israel to learn better tactics of violence and repression to use against us, particularly movements for social justice in the U.S., particularly African and indigenous colonized people in the U.S., And Israel doesn't just share strategies of repression with U.S. police forces. Israel also exports strategies of repression all over the world, in Africa, in Central and South America, and in the Caribbean. For example, in Haiti, and there's a very good article on Hood Communists that talks in more detail about this that I'll put in the chat. But in Haiti, Israel has trained Haitian police forces that then go on to violently repress Haitian people protesting against U.S. imperialism. In the Congo, Israel is looting Congolese resources and also, again, training Congolese security forces to brutally repress Congolese civilians. In Latin America, in Central and South America, Israel has repeatedly backed far right-wing fascist governments, provided them with weapons, with training, with political support to again repress indigenous people's movements and social justice movements. So it's not just Palestinians that the U.S. is helping Israel repress. It's colonized peoples all over this planet. Israel aligns with global imperialism all over the world, which is, again, a clear indication that Zionism is nothing more but a white supremacist, imperialist, stellar colonial project that must be opposed. So let's talk about, let's like bring it all together by talking about what the consequences of global colonialism, global stellar colonialism and imperialism are, what it looks like. It is important to understand that the reason why the U.S., why Europe, why Israel are wealthy so-called first world countries is because of the direct, it's a direct product of the underdevelopment of Africa, the Americas, and Asia. And what that means is that the U.S., Europe, and Israel are wealthy because the rest of the planet is poor. The only reason why a so-called first world exists It's because global capitalism and imperialism rest on a foundation of resources, land, labor stolen from the majority of the planet's population. That is the only reason why there is a first world and a third world. Why is a global north and a global south? It is a giant pile of stolen wealth and bodies. So we are living in a reality of Western imperialist domination led by the U.S. empire. And that reality includes global inequality because of those resources and land and labor stolen. It also means uh, the violent erasure, co-option, and destruction of indigenous and colonized people's cultures globally. Like we are taught 
as African people, for example, that we are somehow less than than European people. If we are Palestinian people, we are taught that our resistance is inherently terror terroristic, that our we have no right to our land, that we are usurpers on someone else's land. If we are indigenous people, we have to deal with being erased from the discourse, living in conditions on a fraction of our own land in very underdeveloped conditions. We have to deal with people claiming themselves to be indigenous when their ancestors engaged in projects of indigenous genocide. We also see globally the dehumanization, racialization, and criminalization of indigenous and colonized peoples, and particularly our resistance. If we are an African uh, person fighting for African liberation, if you're a Palestinian person fighting for Palestinian liberation, if you're an Irish person fighting for Irish uh, liberation, chances are at some point in your journey, you are going to be accused of terrorism. You might even be charged with terrorism and locked up for life. And the reason for that is that the mass, vast violence against us forms the foundation of the global Western imperialist project and our resistance to that project is an existential threat. And so it will always be criminalized. It will always be demonized. And it will always be, they will attempt to step it, stamp it out at any cost. This is why we are the terrorists. This is why our resistance is framed as unacceptably violent. This is why they focus so much time on trying to get us to condemn our own resistance, to condemn ourselves, because it is an existential threat to their domination that is destroying this planet and which has destroyed our nations. So some of the strategies of domination ongoing in the world today um, look like land and resource theft that is leading to the total destruction of the planet that we all need to live. It is the capitalist imperialist system that is leading to the devastating impacts of climate change um, that we are all suffering through or uh, all suffering through um, and that indigenous and colonized peoples are on the front line on. This is a tactic of Western imperialist domination. Um, another tactic of Western imperialist domination that is actually one of the most common tactics is what's known as economic warfare. So like the U.S. blockade on Cuba, the Israeli blockade of Zion on Palestine that doesn't allow food and water in and out, economic sanctions placed on countries that are resisting imperialism, like Venezuela, like uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, like Iran. Um, those are examples of strategies of Western imperialist domination meant to put down resistance. And also debt traps, like um, International Monetary Fund, structural adjustment programs that force countries to destroy their safety nets, that force countries to privatize their resources so that Western corporations can have access to them. All of these are tactics of economic warfare. Another strategy of domination is puppet governments and captured militaries. This is particularly the case um, in the African continent, although it happens everywhere. Um, there are 54, 54 or 55 African nations have a military agreement um, with NATO or the U.S. military through AFRICOM. There's only one independent military in Africa. That's the Eritrean military. All the rest of the militaries have military agreements and direct training um, and weapons from the U.S. and from NATO countries. And the consequence of that is that when African people engage in organized resistance against resource theft, against land theft, against the exploitation of our labor and resources by Western imperialism, including Israel, um, our militaries and police forces turn their weapons on African people, not against the people stealing our land, not against the forces uh, exploiting us and oppressing us, but against the African people that are fighting back. And the reason for that is because of these puppet governments who are beholden to imperialist states like the U.S., like Israel, like Europe, and whose militaries who are beholden, again, um, to these imperialist powers and not to African people. Another major strategy of domination that we see, um, particularly through the media, but also through rhetoric coming from our Western governments, is the demonization of anti-colonial and anti-imperialist resistance. If you are a person who's been engaged in any kind of Palestine solidarity organizing um, since October 7th, then I guarantee I am quite sure that at some point you've been asked to condemn Hamas and um, or condemn anti-Semitism before you say that you oppose um, genocide in Palestine. And despite the fact that there is nothing that Hamas could do that could equal the violence, the ongoing violence of the Zionist occupation of Palestine and the ongoing violence of Western imperialism, 
we are expected as a liberation struggle, as a resistance movement, as people in solidarity with those movements, to condemn our own resistance as a prerequisite to be including in conversations of solidarity in the West. That is a rigged game. There is no point whatsoever in condemning any kind of form of anti-colonial and anti-imperialist resistance. The violence of people resisting colonization and imperialism could never in any reality be equal to the violence of imperialism and settler colonialism. It could never. And it is a rigged game to even attempt to play into that, to even attempt to give them what they're asking for. Because the ultimate goal of asking us to condemn that resistance is for us to turn our backs on it entirely. So don't even participate. And then the last thing that I want to say that's going to lead me um, into the, the closing part of this section is that it's really important to understand um, that Israeli identity, U.S. American identity, and Western identity as a whole is deeply tied to these histories and strategies of domination. You can't actually separate it. The understanding of what it means to be a U.S. American, what it means to be as a Israeli citizen, what it meant to be a citizen of Rhodesia, a French citizen of Algeria, is intrinsically tied to the violence of the settler colonial and imperialist project. They cannot be separated. The entire idea that the so-called Western world is more developed and advanced and somehow morally correct than the majority of the world's population is an example of what I mean. There is an a, a, a inherent or inherent belief in the superiority of these colonizing imperialist nations that trickles down into all aspects of their nationalism, all aspects of their identities, and they cannot be separated. We as people fighting in social justice movements in the belly of the beast have to reckon with this have to understand what it means and have to find identities that are separated from that legacy of domination. That is why we call ourselves African people, for example. Um, and just to make it really plain, when we talk about Western identity, when we talk about American identity, rather U.S. American identity, and we talk about Israeli identity, we are talking about identities rooted in white supremacy. Western identity equals white supremacy. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate U.S. American identity from the project of imperialism and settler colonialism and white supremacy that the U.S. was birthed from. You cannot separate Israeli national identity from the project of Zionism. From the very beginning, they were stealing land, stealing resources, committing genocide against Palestinians in, Israel, in occupied Palestine, and against indigenous people in the United States. There is no separating the reality, that reality from U.S. American identity, from Israeli identity, and from Western identity. And I keep saying um, U.S. American because this entire hemisphere, all of the Western hemisphere, is the Americas. But when we talk about American, for some reason, people automatically assume we mean U.S. American. And this is an example of what I mean, the hegemony, the domination, the taking up of all the space in the discourse and the erasure of all the other stories and narratives and nations that exist. Like the reason why American meant one country, not even like the most populous country in the hemisphere instead of the whole hemisphere is because of Western imperialist domination, because of the US empire's hegemony in this hemisphere. And again, just wanna reiterate, you cannot separate Western identity, Western chauvinism, and U.S. American Israeli nationalism from white supremacy. It is built in at the root. Um, I think Nick mentioned some concepts um, that folks should learn about, like Manifest Destiny, which was the idea that the genocide against indigenous people, the violent expansion of European settlers across the U.S. was somehow ordained from God. Um, the Monroe Doctrine, the idea um, I believe under, I think it was Roosevelt, where the, the U.S. had the right to define the, 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 the governmental structure and future of the entire Western Hemisphere, the Nazi German idea of Lebensraum, which is very, very closely connected to the idea of Manifest Destiny, where they were talking about wiping out all of the so-called lesser races in Europe and stealing all of the land for the 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 Ubermensch, like the, the perfect German people, these are built in to 
Western identity, U.S. American identity. And so Zionism as a political co project comes from the very same roots. And we're going to have a webinar uh, later in this series, I believe, on the, 20, the 30th, where we're going to talk about the political roots of the Zionist movement, the anti-Semitic roots of the Zionist movement. So I'll leave it there. But we're going to go more into that. And so just to wrap it up, we've talked in detail about the violence and repression of settler colonialism and what that looks like around the world. We talked about how these settler projects share strategies, how they look similar all over the planet. And now it's important to recognize that any place in the world where you engage in violent repression of oppressed people is going to result in resistance from that people. Oppression breeds resistance always, always. And in fact, colonized people all over this planet, whether they're in Africa or Palestine or the Western Hemisphere or anywhere in this planet, have not just a right, but a duty to resist. We have the right to define our own destinies. We have a right to fight for our land and our identity and our culture. And when I say we have a duty to resist, I mean that the global capitalist imperialist system is destroying the planet that we need to live. It is destroying the water supplies. It is destroying the land. It is pushing us closer and closer to the brink of nuclear annihilation before we are annihilated by climate change. It is a death spiral for this planet and everybody on it and Palestinian people, African people, indigenous peoples, colonized peoples all over this planet who are resisting imperialism are the front line of defense for all of us against the system that is destroying the planet that we need to live on. So we have a right to resist because we have a right to exist. We also have a duty to resist unless we want to die because of what imperialism has done to the planet. Um, it's also important to recognize that we do not have the right to define how any indigenous and colonized person can fight back, particularly not in the belly of the beast. Like, how are you going to pay taxes to the government that has sent billions of dollars and weapons that are now raining down on Palestine and say, Palestinians, you can only fight back in the ways that I find acceptable. That is absurd. Our fight is with the Biden administration, with the Trump administration, with the U.S. government that is providing political military support to Israel. We do not have the right to tell Palestinians how to fight back, just as no Europeans have the right to tell African people how we should fight back. We don't have the right to tell indigenous people of the Americas how they should fight back. When Malcolm X said by any means necessary, he meant that all forms of resistance, including militant resistance, is justified in order to resist imperialism. And again, these anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles are the front line of defense for all of us against a system that is destroying the planet. No matter what tactics of resistance that indigenous and colonized and oppressed peoples engage in, none of our resistance can ever be more violent than the structures and systems of settler colonialism and imperialism. We must be focused on the mission. We must understand that if we believe in justice, our objective must be the total defeat of settler colonialism around the world and the imperialist system globally. We have to destroy these structures that are destroying us, and we have to replace them with systems that are based on justice and life. And again, Palestinian people, indigenous people, African people, people resisting colonization and imperialism all over this planet are our front lines of defense in that struggle to build a new global order based on justice and life. So I just want to wrap up by talking briefly, and I know I have like eight minutes, and I feel like I'm going to finish right on time. I feel it. Um, so I just want to talk about some global resistance struggles um, that are happening right now. As I mentioned, the All African People's Revolutionary Party is part of the worldwide Pan-African movement, whose objective is the total liberation and unification of Africa under a socialist government. We are part of a global struggle to af liberate Africa and African people worldwide. And one of the most exciting advancements in that struggle that's unfolding as we speak is what's known as the Alliance of Sahelian States, which includes Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, which in the past few years have successfully driven out French imperialism from their land, driven out 
French troops from their land and now who are now allying economically and politically and who are who are talking about building a pan-African movement in Africa. Another example is the Revolutionary Socialist Project of the Cuban Revolution, which has for more than 60 years uh, defended itself successfully against continuous attacks by the U.S. government. And also, just want to note, Every single year in the United Nations General Assembly, the U.S. blockade on Cuba is condemned by the majority of the world's population. And every single year, the only countries that vote not to condemn the blockade are the U.S. and Israel and any other client state that the U.S. has on a string at the time. Like one time it was Colombia um, before the progressive government was elected. Another time it was Ukraine. That's another story. But U.S., Israel consistently vote against condemning the U.S. blockade because settler states have each other's backs. And then of course, the national liberation struggle currently unfolding in Palestine is a clear example of a resistance to imperialism, successful resistance to imperialism that is happening right now that must have our political and material support. Not just the uprising on October 7th, but also the fact that the Palestinian armed resistance right now is militarily defeating the Israeli military. That is why Israel is so focused on civilian targets, because they cannot make any uh, substantive advancements against the Palestinian armed resistance, which is made up of many groups. So we must support global resistance to imperialism in Palestine, in Africa, in Cuba, in the Western Hemisphere, we must, as people in the belly of the beast, stand on the right side of history, stand with the global oppressed, rising up against imperialism and fighting for our future on this planet. So thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. That was incredible. Um, I feel like I'm so sad that this is about to end because our panelists were just incredibly amazing. I think I speak for the most of us that we learned so much from the both of you. Thank you so, so, so much. Uh, we will be starting our Q&A portion right now. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A function. We'll go ahead and start. Um, so one reoccurring question that we had um, before uh, when people signed up and during our uh, the presentation was regarding Indigenous solidarity. So it was a specific question about um, how do people, comrades of a non-Indigenous background, people from the Black Lives Matter movement, the liberation movement, who are building up solidarity with Palestine, how do we then build up that support for the Indigenous struggle here? And I think I'll just offer a little bit of my two cents. I think for a lot of us organizers, activists within the Western Hemisphere, I think we do have to um, confront our position, um, our positionality within the belly of the beast that we have to understand what our our complicity is on this land. And I think that's part of the we reason why there is that kind of like disconnect. Um, and just like our presenters mentioned that when we say that we are against Zionism and settler colonialism, we have to take that to honestly its logical conclusion, which means, you know, the settler state that we occupy here. So I want to pose that question to you guys. Um, how can we um, as organizers and activists and liberation movements in the Western Hemisphere, how do we drum up more support and more solidarity for Indigenous struggle, Indigenous movement here at home? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I'll just jump right in. Um, um, actually, this is a conversation that Onye and I used to have a long time ago when we both lived in Albuquerque. Um, but I think it's important to remember that, you know, when we have like the movements such as Stop Cop City, uh, movements to stop, you know, the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, that the settler state in its surveillance of Native people and Palestinians and, and African folks, it sees these movements as connected. You know, they're, they're, it sees them as, you know, the settler state and its oppression is intersectional. It doesn't want us to be united, you know, um, but just uh, just out of spite of the settler state, that's not why we should unite. You know, that's not why we have those conversations. And there are also are really there are difficult conversations that need to have uh, need to be had. I don't think, um, you know, for example, I don't necessarily think I don't buy into the argument that 
native people in North America are somehow natural allies to Palestinians. We have to raise our level of consciousness to understand the system that oppresses us first and foremost, right? And that it doesn't, you know, you're sure settler colonialism is always about native people, but it's not just about native people. It's about our allies and struggle and how we want to build a new world. You know, um, there's often this kind of really false backward notion to say that somehow the response to the white supremacist ethno state is to build a another ethno state. And I think it's it's a it's a it's a projection on one hand. Right. It's going to like the whole idea that we're going to do. Uh, to them what they did to us in terms of like creating this exclusionary boundary or implement a kind of modern capitalist state. We have to, we have to begin to imagine and think about, uh, you know, formations, political, uh, formations that exist beyond, you know, what, what is currently on offer in, in, in liberal, in liberalism specifically, capitalist imperial liberalism, right? Um, and I think there are examples, especially in this hemisphere, the, the project of plurinationalism that you do not get, you know, you do not center the individual, you center the collective, your national origin, that there can be political projects that are not just about individuals and individual rights um, that protect private property, but are about sort of the collective benefit of groups of people understanding that their peoplehood as distinct as, you know, as cultures, but also understanding that our strength isn't our homogeneity. Our strength is our diversity and our, you know, not the, not the DEI version of diversity, but the diversity of who we are as human beings and, and how we understand, you know, when we talk about indigenous sovereignty, we're not invoking the Westphalian state model of sovereignty, which is premised on exclusion, first and foremost. Indigenous people existed by the hundreds of nations, right? Uh, in relation with each other, and we didn't genocide each other. Right. The modern state formation, as we understand it today, the nation state formation is a relatively recent phenomenon. So, too, is capitalism and, and imperialism. It's not the natural state of things. Right. And so when we talk about these these alliances, we have to actually denaturalize the things that make us separate. And I think Onye has pointed out, you know, racialization is, is one of the fundamental core features of capitalism. Right. Why is it that certain regions of the world become sacrifice zones, become zones of profit making and extraction. Why isn't, you know, why isn't the, uh, the child who's mining diamonds in Congo paid the same wage as a white person, a tech CEO, you know, in, in Silicon Valley? It's because of racial capitalism. It's because of a capitalist world system that extracts value from one place and then tries to realize it in a different place. That's how the world is, you know, that's how the world is shaped. And the only way that we get to a point where we, we understand that these unjust relations have to be undone is to understand that these understand the things that separate us while also retaining and understanding our histories as distinct people are incredibly important and should thrive in the, you know, be contributions to these, you know, to these moments and whatever, you know, country that has yet to exist that we have to bring into existence, but also understanding that there are hundreds of peoples and nations that have existed before the United States, in spite of the United States and after the United States. And I think that's, you know, you can't be afraid to say that, you know, there's a, a long, long history, uh, you know, that's that's being ignored. And I think, um, you know, it's it's our our task uh, to build something collectively as as, you know, as many people's, not just as, you know, one kind of American people or whatever it is, but as many people's, um, you know, like as the Zapatistas say, a world in which many worlds fit. And I think I really I very much buy into that, that idea. No, thank you so much for that. I think it's also an aspect of the settler colonial project that it has this enduring effect where we think it's eternal. That when we live and we live in a time or an age of empire, we think and believe that empire is eternal and always has been. But you understand that there isn't a beginning and end to these things and um, that there is a historical curve and trajectory. And we have to and that's why it's so important that we historicize and place ourselves 
um, accurately, you know, within within the moment that we don't fall into. I think what tends to happen, this kind of like demoralizing after effect, you know, I think it's, you know, what, two months and more, you know, after October 7th, and you start to see this kind of, uh, I would say, you know, this kind of activist like kind of burnout because because of this. Um, and this is why we have to enhance and heighten our political consciousness um, to like what you mentioned. So thank you so much for that. Anya, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think or we like- really got it. Mic drop. <laughs> awesome. Um, so continuing on, so I think just gearing the questions a little bit to more about organizing efforts. So one question we got is, given the deep history of Zionism and the settler colonial project um, and the American commitment to this, what do you think about Americans asking their politicians, representatives to call for ceasefire? How effective could the strategy be if Israel is and has been for decades an extension of the U.S. empire? Are they peaceful taxes? Are these peaceful taxes a form of insanity, you know, doing something, the same thing repeatedly and expecting change? So what is your guys' response to this? So a couple of things come up for me around this question and specifically around demand for a ceasefire. One is that there has to be like what's happening now, um, over 20,000 Palestinians killed um, from Israeli attacks since October is not a sustainable situation that in order for Palestinians to fight, they need the space to do that. And the U.S. is providing the weaponry. The U.S. is providing the global political support. And there is we in the U.S. have to organize and mobilize and demand that it stop. Having said that, it's also true that the reality situation is that the U.S. depends on Israel for its strategy in the Middle East um, and the rest of the world. Um, that there is not going to be a point where the U.S. stops backing Israel because it's the right thing to do. Like the exist, the Zionist project, um, the Israeli occupation is key to Western imperialism strategy. And so I think that we have to recognize the reality situation that it is very unlikely that we are going to get a meaningful response to the demands for a ceasefire. At best, we're probably going to get crumbs. And we also have to recognize that this is a moment, this moment of mass mobilization is an opportunity for deepening people's analysis of what's happening and why. For helping them understand, like, thousands and, th- like, 300,000 people marched in Washington, D.C. in November calling for a ceasefire. And the Biden administration said, nah, y'all are all terrorist anti-Semites. Biden's mm-hmm. own uh, staffers covered their faces and went in front of the White House and were like, ceasefire now. And he was like, shut up. How about a pizza party? Like, they are not going to give us a ceasefire because they need Israel in the Middle East. They don't care about Palestinian lives. And we have to, as organizers, help people understand why. We have to uh, deepen the demand for a ceasefire to an ending of the Israeli occupation, to an ending of the Zionist project, but also to resistance against Western imperialism. People have to understand the connections. And this is our opportunity. When thousands of people, like I never thought I would see in my life, uh, an anti-imperialist movement of this scope, this level of mass mobilization for something that's happening to people outside of the U.S. Because the U.S. ruling class and media work very, very, very hard to keep people narrowly focused on what's happening in the U.S. and to make them apathetic and ignorant about what's happening outside of the world. But in this moment, people are questioning what they are seeing. They are posing U.S. imperialist interests and is an opportunity for us in the global anti-imperialist movement and in our respective national liberation struggles to to get them into deeper solidarity and into deeper, more organized action. So I think that we have to continue to mobilize and demand a ceasefire. And I also think that that action, that mobilization has to be brought in to resist Zionism, to resist settler colonialism, to resist imperialism. And we can do it. Awesome. Nick, any, any, anything to add to that? No, I, uh, I need to really kind of summed it up. I'll just add one thing because I think um, just to kind of build on on what she said was, you know, with boycott, divestment, and sanctions, people typically are like, "Well, what is boycotting? You know, uh, is it really going to do anything?" And it's like 
some people say, well, it's as, it's as good as saying, you know, uh, a land acknowledgement, you know, but it, the difference between a land acknowledgement here in the United States, and, you know, I support it in some sense because you do need to acknowledge that we st- we're still here, but it's mm-hmm. an empty gesture because it doesn't actually change the socioeconomic reality. Mm-hmm. The settler state does it from a position of power, knowing that there's nothing that's going to change. But if you do that, you you know, what seems like symbolic gestures in the Palestinian situation actually delegitimizes the ongoing violence that mm-hmm. Israel is perpetrating. It's ongoing occupation, right? It delegitimizes mm-hmm. that. And it does have a more of a, like a socioeconomic material impact on the ground because mm-hmm. it relies on that legitimacy, that it relies on that cultural legitimacy within the eyes of the world. Um, so I, I would say even, even if we cannot, you know, bring our own, you know, political ruling class to call for a ceasefire here and there, city councils, whatever it is, you know, uh, representatives doing it is important and, and doing it in mass, you know, with, you know, the, like there are people in the streets there are millions of people in the streets who are doing, who are saying this and that's incredibly important, but it's, you know, obviously I think mm-hmm. the majority of people who are in the streets are thinking beyond just what a ceasefire means. You know, they're not just saying that this is something that can sustain itself because, well, what are the political solutions? Well, does it just go back to the state of normal? Does it go back to slow genocide instead of like quick genocide? Yeah. So I think um, those are the questions that only kind of, you know, really challenges us to think beyond just a kind of uh, a ban. You know, it's I'm not going to say it's a bandaid because it, d- it will save lives and it's important. We should be advocating for that. But it's <laughs> it's, it's a temporary. Is it going to be a temporary thing or is it going to be result in the end? You know, is it going to are we going to actually take the boot off the neck, you know, or remove the knife from the back? Mm -hmm. I think what you just said um, really highlights, again, the the necessary, the the need to have these kind of uh, analyses and these kind of discussions, because it is about um, understanding what are the logical conclusions of what we're asking for. Um, What does it actually mean to oppose settler colonialism and take that actually to its, you know, logical conclusion? So, as an organizer, I think that's a really helpful framework, or at least like, you know, even like a a practical one to say, well, okay, well, this is a step, but then what comes after that? And then to understand that, you know, when we call, you know, for an immediate, um, you know, ceasefire, obviously it's like an end to the the immediate genocidal violence we see unfolding. But after that, are we asking then for a return to the colonial order? And then what do we do about that? Um, so these are really important questions to really consider and have us, you know, challenge as organizers. Um, another question, I guess, regarding organizing, there's been a lot of uh, news and like a lot of media focus on the UN as a civil society formation and pressure on the UN and the role of the UN. What, if any, utility do you guys find in orienting around war crimes and more largely the UN as a formation? Um, as like a moral metric for behavior and like e- even strategy for strategic action. Well, I don't think it's, I don't, I think we should like completely set aside the, mm-hmm. the moral metric piece um, and just yeah. focus on like the strategy piece. Cause I think that mm-hmm. it's just, I feel like the structure of moral morality that we under operate under is like a Western dominated one. And so you can like kill millions of people, but if you yeah. like, rock then you're the wrong it's just no so but i think with the the strategy of like for example like uh south africa uh recently brought a case against israel's israel for its genocide of palestinians to the international court of justice and Mm -hmm. i think what we see like the way that israel responded is instructive for understanding the utility of these strategies because as Mm -hmm. soon as south africa did that israel immediately starts attacking south africa attacking the entire process. Now, we understand, like, the ICC, the ICJ, the United Nations, these bodies are dominated by Western imperialist states because Western imperialism dominates the world. And so most frequently we see Global South nations getting any kind of accountability in these structures and Western imperialist nations getting away with murder, quite literally. But there is, like, a like a propaganda uh, uh, purpose and also, like, an organizing purpose for taking this kind of action. And I feel like you can see it 
in Israel's response. Like they are extremely invested in winning the propaganda war and winning the yeah. narrative war. And South Africa, by taking this action of taking Israel to the ICJ and explicitly naming what they're doing as genocide is a direct blow in that propaganda war. And so I feel like that is the utility. Like right now they are dominating the narrative. Right now in the U.S., the majority of the discourse is about how resistance to genocide is somehow equal or worse than genocide itself. How res- mm-hmm. our solidarity with Palestinian people is somehow intrinsically antagonistic to Jewish people. Like they have completely got us caught in the weeds talking about like the, the basic legitimacy of our solidarity. But by saying Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians, South Africa has cut through all of that and said, this is what's happening. This is wrong. And I think there is a very strong utility for that in terms Mm -hmm. of our organizing globally. Yeah, I'll just add add like a historical, you know, uh, anecdote. Um, The League of Nations, which was this kind of post-World War I formation that was supposed to, you know, implement self-determination and be you know stop prevent another world war um you know which is essentially just a european civil war um actually collapsed in you know in the in the late 1930s uh over the the question of italy invading ethiopia because the league of nations refused to condemn or take action legal action against italy because it didn't see uh ethiopia as civilized enough and and you know advanced enough right we can see the same mentality with palestine it's barely recognized you know as a it's they call it the state of palestine but is it a state you know does a state is it, it's completely controlled externally by um you know even the palestinian authorities controlled by israel but there's this kind of pantomiming of legitimacy as Anya kind of pointed out, around Israel's continued occupation and existence on stolen land and amongst a captured people who are literally imprisoned within a an open air concentration camp. Mm-hmm. But yet we are supposed to believe that these kind of rules apply equally, right? The universal declaration on human rights we know isn't universal when it comes to the question of Palestine. And so I think it's going to be, I think I, I support the South African, you know, um, a petition uh, and, uh, you know, against um, uh, against the state of Israel for its, its uh, you know, for perpetrating genocide. But I don't have like, again, it's it's when it comes to the question of Palestine, it's dominated by Western imperial interests. Look at the ICJ judges. You know, yeah. they have to get eight votes out of, I think it's like 16 or uh, 15. I can't remember how many judges they have, mm-hmm. but most of them are like aligned with the United States, right? Or a line had made, have made, you know, have normalized relations with Israel. So I don't know. I don't have, I don't, I don't, I'm not feeling confident that the ICJ is mm-hmm. be uh, a neutral arbiter when it comes to the question of of Palestine and, and genocide, but the question should then frighten the rest of us because if it's okay mm-hmm. to live stream a genocide in front of the entire world, I can literally watch it on my phone. Mm-hmm. What else is it okay to do? You know, it is the mm-hmm. like as uh, you know, uh, Gustavo Petro said. That this is going to be a global Nakba, right? Whether it comes to the 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 genocide of Palestinians or the genocide that's going to result in is resulting because of of climate change, that is largely the responsibility of the northern imperialist powers holding the rest of the world hostage, right? The last COP uh, COP meeting, I can't remember which. I think it was COP twenty six, was it? Or I don't remember mm-hmm. the number, but. The entire COP meeting was dominated by the question of Palestine, whether a right, whether people have the whether one state has the right to genocide another group of people. That was Mm -hmm. the question and they couldn't resolve it. But people were walking out. But it shows there's a shift. And I think uh, Onya in her presentation, the concluding part of her presentation has shown that that people are delinking. Nations are delinking 
from this imperialist supply chain. They're delinking from the sort of political hegemony um, that the United States has, has, you know, perpetuated on the rest of the world, has, has Europe has perpetuated on the rest of the world. And so we're seeing mm-hmm. new political, um, you know, uh, things, uh, uh, projects emerge, but yet the United States still holds the veto power. Yeah. To deny the will of billions of people on the planet for a cease mm-hmm. to deny the will, uh, you know, the, the right of Palestinians not to be genocided, to live as they as they should. Right. They hold mm-hmm. that bloody hand. Just think about it, that that bloody hand that was raised twice that could have ended all of this was, you know, raised to continue to back this genocidal regime. If they're willing to walk into the inferno that Israel has created into Gaza, what else are they willing to walk us into and the rest of humanity into? So when the question of the United Nations comes up, it's important. I think it is a site of struggle. It's a, it's a, it's where some nations can only find a voice. It's important. I believe that we should have international cooperation. I'm not, you know, some kind of narrow minded person. These discussions need to happen, but I also don't have faith in Western imperial powers to, yeah. to, to, you know, exert a, a shred of humanity when it comes to the question of Palestine or the global South. No, um, no, thank you so much for that. I think it's really important we think through how we work within civil society institutions, within, you know, different kind of strategies, um, you know, again, to not just an, to call for an end of the genocide, but an end of, you know, this parasitic uh, kind of, you know, settler uh, state and relationship. I mean, and and with that, for, I guess, for organizers, um, one question that came up was, with the think globally and act locally mindset, what are some examples of providing both political and material support to global resistance to imperialism within our own communities? This webinar, hey. <laughs> um, like organizing political education spaces to develop people's consciousness of what's happening in the world, to help them understand the connections between what they see in their communities, the issues they can clearly identify, and what's happening all over this planet. Like a lot of work is put into making people in the U.S. believe that so-called domestic issues have nothing to do with international issues. And we got to focus mm-hmm. on the domestic and international. We'll do it if we have time. That's not true. It has never been true. Like I mentioned in my presentation, the cops that are beating us at protests who are occupying our communities are trained by the IDF in Israel. So we have to help people understand the direct connection between the global and the domestic. We have to have political education spaces like this, not just Mm -hmm. virtually, but in person, where our people are. Like here in Orlando, the APRP organized with an organization known as Real Orlando, uh, what we called an edu forum on Niger and Haiti and on uh, uh, domestic police violence. And we were literally just like drawing the connection for people. And it was clear, like the real situation is that most folks don't know what's happening. If they understood what was really happening in Palestine, what was really happening in Haiti, what was really happening in Cuba, they would oppose U.S. imperialism. But a lot of time and energy and resources are invested in keeping people confused and in the dark. And we as revolutionaries, as organizers, as people fighting for social justice have a responsibility to help them understand what's happening, to develop their consciousness, to develop their critical thinking skills so they can understand what the system is, how it works, and our responsibility to oppose it and our capacity to oppose it. The other thing um, that's really, really important is being active in political organizations, fighting for justice, whether it's like a mutual aid collective or a socialist political party or what have you, like some kind of collective of people working together. And then within the context of that organization, taking organized action to raise resources and give them to the resistance. Like in the APRP, that is a huge focus of our work in the worldwide Pan-African movement. That is a huge focus of our work. We have more resources in the West. We raise resources in the West and we send them to our chapters in Africa, like direct material support 
two resistance struggles. In the Cuba Solidarity Movement, it's very, very, very similar. When the Trump administration applied maximum pressure sanctions on Cuba in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. Cuba Solidarity Movement literally gathered thousands and thousands and thousands of syringes to send to Cuba so they could put vaccines into the arms of their citizens. That kind of work is happening in political organizations throughout the U.S. So, these responsibilities of engaging in political education, of engaging in material solidarity, happen best in the context of political organizations. So if you're not in an organization, join an organization and then start educating your community, start engaging in discussions about these issues, and start raising resources and transferring them to national liberation struggles, anti-imperialist struggles around the world. Just one quick thing to add to that. It's as we saw in you know 2020 with the George George Floyd uprisings, as we're seeing now. We're really good at mobilizing, right? We're really good at putting people out in the street. We're really good at showing up uh, in moments of outrage and reacting to these, you know, this like these flagrant instances of of murder of you know our black relatives or Palestinian relatives. Like we're really good at doing that. But the forces, you know, there's we have to ask ourselves, where is the organizations that we have? you know, to sustain. And they, a lot of them have been destroyed, you know, by uh, attacks by, you know, the, the state, you know, through surveillance, you know, some people talk about like COINTELPRO, like it's this kind of like crazy conspiracy thing. And it's, it's, it happened to the black movement, it happened to the native movement. It continued on into the eighties, you know, with CISPES, uh, with the El Salvadorian uh, revolutionaries, like it, you know, th- it didn't end. Right. Leonard Peltier is in prison. He served he's he's served eight life sentences so far. For for mm-hmm. what? For having the dream of freedom, right? But one of the things that they've they've attempted to do, and I don't think they've been quite successful um in in completely annihilating this long tradition of resistance. But we need, you know, we need to go beyond just mobilizing. We're really great at mobilizing. But it's when we get organized and understand that this is a long term struggle that we have to dedicate our lives to that we're not, we may not, you know, hopefully I want to see liberation in my lifetime. But we have to realize that somebody sacrificed, somebody sat in a jail cell, you know, somebody gave their life so I could be here talking today, right? And to remember that that was a long term commitment. So we have to be good ancestors to future generations, right? By making sure that we are creating the infrastructure that's necessary to carry this forward, to provide resources, you know, as Onye said, uh, to to people who need it when we have when you when we have that surplus, when we have access to that surplus, right? But also those resources, you know, aren't just sort of like money and you know tangible things. It's also for us in in the imperial core in the belly of the beast, it's about raising the consciousness, you know, that uh, of our own people and building organizations that are are going to sustain themselves, so that we can we can yes we can continue to mobilize, but we're also having organized uh, sort of articulations of what those demands are. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much, Ani. Um, unfortunately, everyone, we have to end it there. We've run out of time. You can find Ani with the AAPRP and Hood Communists there. You can find Nick Estes with the Red Nation, Red Media. Uh, we will be having, again, our series. Our next episode will be next Tuesday at 7 p.m., where we will be talking and historicizing the Islamic resistance in Gaza. Uh, please join us then. Um, I want to thank everyone again for your questions, for your participation. Um, we hope to see you next week. And I think we would, I, one thing I would like to end it with is just restating what our purpose for the series is. Honestly, it just started with a need, recognizing a need that we needed a space to reflect, to raise the political consciousness, to recognize the stage of where our movement is at and how we can build a sustainable movement for Palestine here at home. So thank you so much. And we hope to see everyone next week. Bye, guys.